Get out of your head. That's a horrible place to take your orders. Am I preaching or am I preaching? Every meditation, every loop that starts with self ends in one of two places. And I want you to look for this in your life this week. It's either going to end in scarcity or shame. Every sermon that you preach to yourself, and you are always preaching to yourself. In fact, Martin Lloyd Jones said that our problem is we spend too much time listening to ourselves and not enough time preaching to ourselves. Isn't that what David's Psalms have shown us? Where he would say to his soul, It's time to go to school, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. He's preaching to himself, and so are you. But when you preach to yourself from yourself, your sermon will always lead to scarcity. Brene Brown says that the number one meditation of many of our hearts is not enough. She says we apply it to time. We apply it to money. We apply it to our talent. And the sermon that plays in our mind, if we would ever stop and listen to it, it starts every morning, not enough. How much sleep did you get last night? How much money do you make on that job? Graham asked me the other day, Dad, is $56,000 a year a lot of money? I said, it is till you make it. That might be the devil's favorite sermon. Not enough. Not enough. Not enough. He preached it to the disciples because they looked at 5,000 men and women and children, and Jesus said, Feed them. And they said, Well, we don't have a whole lot. And we don't have a whole lot. We have five loaves and two fish, but that's not enough because they were starting with themselves, but they were standing next to the source. I wonder how different the story would be if you would ask the source instead of asking yourself. Check the source. He's more than enough. Somebody shout, He's more. He's more. Y'all don't ever shout in the back of the room when I start hollering like this. I know y'all don't like it when I holler, but this is not a silent sermon. This is a loud sermon. Somebody shout, He's more. More than enough. Every need, every deficiency, all my failures. His blood is enough. His grace is enough. His word is enough. The law of the Lord is pure, reviving the soul. But if I start with myself, I end with scarcity. It's a loop. Because I start down here. And so by the time I've looped around through my day, I end my day feeling depleted. I wonder if you got a new loop. I wonder if you got a new loop and started with the source instead of starting with yourself. I wonder how the cycle would change. If you started with your source, I know it's basic, but didn't David start with the heavens and then move toward his heart? The skies declare the glory of God. They show forth his power day after day, and night after night, and day after day, and night after night. And all I've got to do to stay in step with God is keep the beat of heaven happening inside my heart. Because there's always enough in heaven. There's always enough patience in heaven. There's always enough provision in heaven. There's always enough bread in heaven. There's always enough. Always enough. Always enough. My God shall supply all of your needs according. What if you got in that loop? What if you asked God to fill your empty places? When you start with yourself, you end in scarcity. You start with yourself, you end in shame. Because I look at myself and I feel like David. David does something weird. I think he wrote this song. It's contested. 
he, he might have written it, he might have not written it, but let's give him credit. Because this is a psalm that embodies a characteristic known as wisdom poetry. It kind of it kind of switches beats in the middle of the song. It's going on and on about the skies and the heavens. For many years, they thought it was two different poems put together. As they were studying back and trying to find out how it was written and when it was written, it was such a sharp break at verse seven that they thought, well, maybe this is a different thing. You know, we're talking about the skies and the sun and the stars. And then all of a sudden, David makes a break in verse seven. And he starts talking about the law of the Lord. Watch what he says. It's perfect, refreshing the soul. Look at verse 12. But who can discern their own errors? So he is an imperfect man looking into a perfect law. He's looking at what the law is and what it does and how it brings peace, wisdom, and joy. But yet he knows that he has broken the very law that produces the very things that he wants. I don't think it's much of a break because he is contemplating how the heavens are able to effortlessly declare the glory of God, but he cannot. Because I'm stuck in a cycle called sin. And there are secrets in my heart that no matter how much I dress them up with the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart fall short of the glory of God. Paul knew it too. He said what the law was powerless to do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature. Look what God did. God started a new loop. See, through the law, man tried to reach his way to God, but it was a cycle of shame caused by sin. So I reach and fall short and try and fall short and repent and fall short and get up and fall down and reach and fall short and try and fall short and get up and fall down. And God broke the cycle. For in the fullness of time, God sent forth his Son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. For what the law was powerless to do, in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful man, so that we can say, There is therefore now no condemnation. There is therefore. Let me give you a new loop. No condemnation. No condemnation. No condemnation. For those who are in Christ Jesus, this is the kind of gospel preaching that got me to the cross. This is the kind of gospel preaching that will break the chains of shame off of your life. This is the kind of gospel preaching that you can preach on Monday morning, Tuesday night, Wednesday afternoon. You can preach this stuff to yourself. There is therefore now no condemnation. Why? Because I'm in Christ. In other words, touch seven people and tell them, I got a new loop. I got a new loop. That's what the gospel gives me, a new meditation. And watch this. I no longer live by situation. Get ready to jump up. I live by revelation. I know who he is. I know who I am in him. You better touch seven more people tell them, I got a revelation. I got a revelation. Whatever I go through, I got a revelation of who's in the fire with me. I know what he did. I know who he is. I know who I am in him. I got a new loop. I'm losing my voice. Y'all shout for me. Woo. You get that in your heart? You'd be finishing the devil's sermons in no time. He might start them, but you let grace finish them. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, the devil will be scared to talk to you. He will. Because every failure he brings up is going to trigger within your mind a new loop to realize that grace is greater than my failure. Grace is greater. I don't know. Maybe you're going to live in a new loop. It is not the sermon that I preach to you that determines the course of your life. It's the sermon you preach to yourself. It's what you say to yourself. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable. Acceptable. Accept. Accept. Accept what God says about you. Reject everything else and live your life under an open heaven. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the skies declare his wonder. Day after day they pour forth speech, and they don't need any words to do it. It's a silent sermon. It's the silent sermon that determines whether or not you step out on faith or stay in your comfort zone. It's the silent sermon you preach to yourself that determines whether you continue to live in a place of regret and resentment or you step forward into your tomorrow, believing that God will use all things for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. It's not this. It's the second sermon. I always thought it was so weird that the, that the preacher would pray, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. But I get it now. He was saying, there's two sermons happening. There's what I say to you, and there's what you say to yourself. And you've got to learn how to be the coach of your own soul. I wish Davo Sweeney was here. He could help us. I was considering hiring a coach recently for leadership, and I wanted somebody who could help me to analyze my own leadership. And That's probably a good thing to do, but I was praying about it, and God said, be your own head coach. Head coach. <laughs> you hear me? I thought about titling this message, Help, My Mind is a Mess, and I Don't Know Where to Start to Put It in Order. That would be more accurate to our real lives, but I decided to call it the silent sermon instead because I found out that I have a second self. I have the self that tells me everything that's wrong with me, and then I have this second self. It's not really even me. It's a deposit guaranteeing my inheritance. It's the Holy Spirit of God dwelling in me. When I say he's in my heart, I'm not talking about an organ any more than David is talking about the Son as being a celestial body. He's talking about the faithfulness of God in poetic language. It is theology wrapped in poetry. So when he said the meditations of my heart, I thought I need to be my own head coach. I think that I need to let the God in me talk to the me in me. I think I need to start letting my second self talk to my screwed-up self. I even started doing it practically. and For me, I have to get out of my head so I have to write things down, because up here is… Whoa. <laughs> I can't keep it straight. It comes real fast. But when I write it down, it helps me to slow down a little bit and focus. Slow down. It gets that constant. So that the real me can speak. And I write letters to me from the other me. I know a schizophrenic pastor is not what you always pray for. I'm going to help somebody, though. I write on the top of my page. I write down every time I do this, three times a week, Holy Ghost coaches notes. I write it down, and then I talk to myself like I 
like myself, believe in myself, see myself, and know myself. Because I figure all of those are characteristics of the God in me. So if I can sit down long enough to listen to what Elijah heard as a still, small voice. See, the wind came through the rocks, and Elijah heard nothing. I could preach a good sermon. We can sing a good song. You might not get it. The fire blazed high. Elijah heard nothing, nothing reassuring. Wind blew, the fire, the earth started shaking. Earth, wind, and fire did an opening act, and Elijah wasn't impressed. But the Hebrew word is interesting. It says God was in the whisper. It was in that silent sermon that Elijah realized that what he was running from was already taken care of. It was in that silent sermon that he realized God had already appointed someone to put to death those who threatened his own life. It was in that silent sermon that Elijah realized that there was already a successor appointed, that his ministry had not been in vain. It was in that silent sermon that he realized that there was still work to be done, and I can't stay in this place of self-pity anymore. It's the silent sermon. The silent sermon. Wonder if that's why Joshua told the people not to say anything for the first six days they walked around the wall. Because he knew they would start saying stuff to talk each other out of going into the land God had given them. Sometimes the best strategy is shut up. I know you've always wanted to do this and you hated touching your neighbor in church until this point, but look at them and say, shut up. That's the strategy. Shut up. Well, y'all like that a little too much. I'm worried about Rock Hill. There might be a fight in the parking lot. And on the seventh day, you can shout, but it's the shout after the silence. So I write little coaches' notes to myself. No, you can't see them. They're not for you. I don't, I don't talk to myself like I used to as much anymore. I still do. I'll never forget asking Amy Corbett, do you always walk around telling yourself what an idiot you are? She said, I've never done that in my life. <laughs> oh, yeah, me neither. I was asking for a friend. <laughs> I said, she's on to something. I realized one time I would beat myself up if anybody else was talking to me the way I was talking to me. I'd beat myself up. I'd, I would beat them up. If I was bigger than them, I would beat them up. If they didn't know any moves, I would beat them up. And I'm living in loops of shame and scarcity. And God has freely given me His grace. And it'd be life changing for you to start some new loops. It'd be life changing for you to pray what Pastor Mickey prayed. It'd be life changing for you to change your silent sermons. Listen to them. Do they start with me? They're going to end in shame. Do they start with me? They're going to end in scarcity. But if you start with the source, I bet you'll find springs of living water that have been waiting to well up within you. They're waiting to burst forth. Hey, thank you for watching. Make sure you subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream. And share this video with a friend. And don't forget, you can join me live every Sunday. Thanks again for watching.